You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and for those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much, and please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain, while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, I'd really appreciate it if you could all do me a favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group or to someone you know that can benefit from a particular show. Now, it will help us reach more people. We will all together be making a positive difference. Now, Answers for the Family will continue to address a variety of issues such as locating a runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and creating greater health, happiness, and so much more for you and your family. Now, we will introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and fun for you and your family. Now, this is a show I think that everybody knows somebody um, that probably could listen and gain something from. Now, as we near the holidays, our topic today is Think Yourself Thin. Now, our guest, J.J. Smith, is the author of the runaway bestsellers, Green Smoothies for Life, and the number one New York Times bestseller, 10-Day Green Smoothie Cleanse. Now, she is a nutritionist and certified weight loss expert who has been featured on The Dr. Oz Show, The Steve Harvey Show, uh, The Jamie Foxx Show, and she's made appearances on NBC, Fox, the CW Network, as well as the pages of Glamour, Essence, Women's World, and Ladies Home Journal. Now, she reclaimed her own health, losing weight and discovering a second youth in her 40s. And she has become the voice of inspiration to those who want to lose weight, be healthy, and to use one of her quotes, get their sexy back. JJ, welcome to Answers for the Family. Hello, how are you doing? I am doing great. Uh, I think the timing is perfect for this show. Um, you know, I, I mentioned it a little bit in our last show that everybody should listen. As we get close to the holidays, this is a good time to kind of reevaluate where we're at in this area. What's your thoughts? I, I think so. Everybody knows that New Year's is the time of reflection. It's the most popular time for starting a new weight loss plan. And I always say if you get ready in November, then you'll already be in full swing when uh, January 1 comes around. So I actually like the last two months to finish strong so you have some momentum going into the new year. (laughs) Well, I think that makes perfect sense. But also, it's also the time in which everybody has all of those treats sitting in front of them. You know, know, we're, we're all going to parties and everybody has the... You know, the chips and the candies and the cookies and everything else. out yes. there. So I think this is a good time for people to also start thinking about this rather than than splurging through the holidays and then come January 1st going, maybe I should start something. That's right. And um, December, I mean, we do more parties in December than we probably do all year. And so all of that holiday party food tends to catch up with us for sure. Well, as someone who who makes a green smoothie every day and read Green Smoothies for Life and the 10-Day Green Smoothie Cleanse, why did you feel that we needed Think Yourself Thin and why now? Well, after helping folks lose over 2 million pounds in two years on the Green Smoothie Cleanse, I realized there were some differences between those people who were able to reach their weight loss goal versus those who start and never finish strong, or they lose and gain it all back, or they go on every bad diet out there, but they never get to their goal weight. So I was, I was observing weight loss and trying to understand what caused some people to get to their goal weight, where some people just struggle and struggle. And I think the missing piece, the most overlooked factor for getting to your goal weight is the mental, right? It's, I call it mental mastery. That's the ability to have motivation, discipline, and focus so you can actually get to your goal weight. So everybody knows what to eat, what not to eat, 
but whether or not you're going to eat it has to do with how motivated and focused and disciplined you are. And so this book I wanted to write as a complimentary piece to any diet or weight loss plan to help people really change the way they think, change their habits and behaviors. Well, and, and it makes perfect sense. And it's, as someone who studies the brain, uh, I completely agree. Now, tell us a little bit about from the psychological standpoint. Uh, I know that a lot of us talk about the, the idea of emotional eating. Um, where does, does eating to find comfort uh, affect us? And is your book the one that is now addressing that? Yes, we have a, a couple of chapters dedicated to emotional eating. It's one of the main reasons people can't stick to a weight loss plan. And emotional eating at the highest level is just eating out of based on our feelings. Are we bored? Are we lonely? Are we heartbroken? Are we sad? Are we stressed? Whatever we're feeling to compensate for that feeling, we're actually using food. And what we haven't done is really learned how to process our emotions and feelings very well. Like in school, I don't remember anybody ever teaching me how to process feelings and emotions. So as an alternative, we run to food as a quick uh, way to address some of the feelings that may be uncomfortable for us. And so the book talks about emotional eating, and it has um, what's called a mental mastery challenge, and it gives you a different exercise every day so you can understand the emotional triggers, the things that really set you off down the wrong path. And the way to think about it is, There's emotional hunger and there's physical hunger. So physical hunger comes on every few hours. Your body physically is needing some food for fuel, whereas emotional hunger comes on instantly. It's urgent. You could have eaten a huge meal an hour and you're in the refrigerator staring, looking for something. Well, it's not that you're physically hungry. You just ate. But you have to get to the root cause of why you're looking for food so you can address what you're feeling at that time and know what the emotional triggers are. Yeah, I, I think that that nails it right there, because I think so many times, you know, that that craving at that point, you know, when we say, well, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm craving sweets or I'm, I'm, qu- I'm craving something savory or salty or something like that, that it may not necessarily be that your body needs that, but that emotionally you've tied something to that, you know, that maybe when you were a kid, you were given, you know, well, here, have a candy, you'll feel better or something like that. Right. You know, and so, you know, I love the fact that you're separating these two points and saying, you know, let's come up with a way to figure out, is this your body saying it needs nourishment to keep functioning or is this your mind saying, you know, emotionally, I want this to satisfy a craving that that I don't really necessarily need. Right. And and you raise the point, even as children, sometimes we're rewarded with cookies or candy if we behave or if we finish our homework and we're taught like you know, a reward is eating um, when there's other ways to really compensate for doing a good job. Yeah. And, and I know that, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, I, I realized after a while um, how many business uh, dealings or arrangements that were set up or conferences that were set up that was always set up around food. You know, everything right. was, you know, it was, okay, but we're going to, you know, we're going to meet and have a working lunch. We're going to go over this at lunch or a conference. Yeah. There's going to be a big dinner and there's going to be 10 people at a table and this is going to be your marketing opportunity. But yet I think that after doing that for so many years, there's become a psychological uh, association with setting that meeting up and doing it over food. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, we use food. Food is to nourish us, like you said, and for fuel. And, I mean, even as um, an adult, with uh, so many things that we do, business meetings, even if we have a good workout, we reward ourselves with a croissant or muffin. Mm-hmm. And so we just have to break the habit of allowing food to be such a big part of how we do business, how we live, and the thing that makes us smile. Well, you, you <laughs> made me smile when you talked about that before. <laughs> Um, I used to go right from the, the, the gym that I went to was next door to a grocery store. And so for years I would, I would get done at the gym and in the mornings they would make the, the fresh muffins. And so I would come out of the gym, I could smell the muffins and my reward was I would go in there and get me one of those giant muffins. Yeah. Cause you just had a great workout, right? Exactly. And this is my, <laughs> yeah, but now I've replaced it 
with the green smoothie. So now, That's awesome. now my reward is, you know, that, you know, either, you know, depending if I'm, when I'm at home, it's you know, to make your own, but it's, it's that reward. And now the people that I work out with and stuff, you know, I, you know, I'll make enough for everybody and go, okay, look, this is our reward so that we start getting into that habit to where that is the reward. That is, you know, now what I'm looking forward to. When I'm finishing up that workout, I'm going, yeah, I'm going to get that really nice cold smoothie, you know. And so anyway, so, yes, the the idea of just making that little shift, because I kept wondering, you know, you know, how come I can't get rid of that last couple of inches around the middle? Um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you know, a, a friend of mine was a trainer. He said, he goes, I see you every day. Go out there and eat a muffin. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah, and it's just that little bit may have been keeping you from getting the last few inches off. Yeah. So, so as as we get ready for the holidays, is is there sort of a key strategy as we head into this holiday season that that everybody can kind of pick up and start getting them in the right direction? Well, well, I think the it's a couple of things. I think um, holidays are a time for you know, fellowship, family, friends, reflection. And I think it's a very difficult time to really be overly, overly fixated on what you're eating. I think what's most important is that we create small habits so that we don't totally fall off track. And yet at the same time, we're able to eat and enjoy fellowship with family and friends. So it, to me, it's a real, it's a balancing act between being able to enjoy, you know, certain foods. So I do generally do more of the 80 20 meal where I, I know like if I'm going to a party or Thanksgiving or something's happening later in the day, I'll make sure that I eat healthy and do green smoothies or something for breakfast so that I can enjoy more unhealthier foods at the end of the day. Because what I don't want to do is be fixated on eating healthy and clean every day, all day during the holidays, because I want to partake in my Aunt Judy sweet potato pie. And I want to have things that I don't normally eat and enjoy the party. So I try to balance it with the front of the day being extremely healthy, but knowing that, um, you know, unhealthy things are going to come. So that's about balance. And the balance is the way I tend to enjoy the holidays a little bit more and not feel guilty when I don't uh, eat as clean as I normally do in other months. You know, I love the fact that you brought up the 80-20 world, uh, the the 80-20 rule. Uh, Many of the people in, in my world that you know, that I talk to about things, I use the same term. But one of the reasons that I do, and I'm curious if, if this is part of the reason for you as well, is the stress. Uh, you know, if, if you're stressing over the fact that you're eating something that isn't good for you, are we now uh, building up cortisol in our system that's going to have us store more fat anyway? So isn't it better than to kind of do the 80-20 so that when you do have that sweet potato pie or something like that, that you're not stressed over it, so you're not building up cortisol, so you're still burning it correctly? Yeah, and I mean, it's well documented that high cortisol levels do lead to belly fat, so there's no need adding uh, unnecessary stress, worried about what you're eating. So I totally, I totally agree. It's about stress free, guilt-free eating during the holidays and having a balance without feeling the need to be perfect, but yet enjoying some of the fellowship with family and friends. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, but stress is definitely not going to make losing weight, uh, particularly belly fat, any easier. <laughs> One other thing, too, um, there's a lot of studies that show that tricking your metabolism is actually good for keeping it the metabolism revved up. So when you have a meal that's unhealthy or not as clean and healthy as you normally do, you're also changing the number of calories dramatically that you haven't had in that day versus maybe what you had in the day before. So the concept of tricking your metabolism or eating some cheat meals from time to time actually goes far, not just from an emotional reward standpoint, but also from a making sure your metabolism stays revved up and that you don't lull yourself into eating clean and healthy every day, and your metabolism is like, ah, I don't have to work that hard. You're going to have a salad, salmon, da da da. And so, tricking your metabolism, throwing in some unhealthy meals, are actually really good for weight loss. 
See, that's that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it kind of makes sense if you if you look at it with like working out in the sense of, you know, if you're building a muscle, you know, you, you have to change it up sometimes or you get a yeah. memory. And so what same you're saying concept. is same concept. I like it. Yeah, so. man. When I heard that, I was just elated because <laughs> I um, would love to have some lasagna, burger and fries every now and then. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. I like it. Now, one of the things I know you touch on, uh, you know, in, you've touched on in your books, you know, we all know there are, I, and actually I don't have no idea exactly what it is. There's got to be a million books that have been written on diet. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's every At least. kind of book that's been written out there. And, and you talk about uh, a little bit about the idea of the restrictive diets, you know, that, you know, that, kind of mimics, you know, a famine type of thing, which then causes you to be more hungry or tired. Um, talk about the things that, that we can, do, why that isn't good for you and some of the other things we can do in place of that. Yeah, a lot of times people want to, you know, they may have taken 20 years to gain weight, but they want to lose it in five days, lose it all. And mm-hmm. so they tend to lean toward dramatic bad diets that they can't maintain. And so they, they'll lose weight fast. Like I always tell people, I can give you 101 ways to lose weight fast, but you're going to gain it back just as fast. And so it's important not to lean toward calorie, you know, dramatic calorie restriction as a way to lose weight permanently. There are some benefits to short-term fasting or short-term cleansing, but, you know, short-term as in no longer than maybe 10 days. And what if you do stick on those dramatic fat diets that reduce calories significantly, your metabolism is going to slow. It's going to say, oh, you only get 1,000 or 800 calories per day. I don't have to work that hard. And so it's not going to burn fat as faster. And so you slow your metabolism, making it harder to lose weight in the long run. And so the most important thing is what you're eating, more so than the calories eating. It's the quality of the food and how they're metabolized in the body that's going to determine whether or not it puts your body in a fat burning mode or in a fat storing mode. And we don't want to store fat. We want to burn fat. And Mm -hmm. so it's about what you eat, the quality of the calories, not so much just the quantity. Now, what what are some of the foods that actually um, just digesting them alone causes it, causes you to burn more calories than the food itself actually is? Well, fats, uh, healthy fats, for sure. Healthy fats as in uh, any kind of olive oil, avocado, nuts, seeds, those are going to be ideal. And then really uh, protein. It's really the refined carbs that are problematic for putting our body in, in fat storage mode because what happens when we eat refined carbs, that's the white sugar, white bread, white pasta. When we eat those, they cause our blood sugar to spike. And any time, uh, which raises insulin levels. And when you raise your insulin levels, it causes our body to store fat. It's, it's very plain and simple. So the more of that you eat, the more you stay in fat storing mode. You're storing fat, storing fat. And so when you shift to eat foods that cause the body to burn fat, it's a lot easier to lose weight. And then you don't have to worry about dramatically losing weight um, overnight. You can lose it normal, which is one to two pounds per week. And you'll get to your goal weight, but you won't just, it won't rebound back and just come all back just as fast. Now, what's your, what's your thought on one of the latest things now is fasting. You know, there's a lot of different types of fasting uh, from the standpoint of, of you know, doing, you know, multiple day fasting or, you know, an every other day fasting. What's your thought on fasting as to what is, is best for the body and best for keeping the, the, the weight that we don't want uh, away from us, but still maintaining the, you know, the, the muscle tone and the things that we want to keep. Well, I love fasting. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of cleansing and detoxing. Um, but I also love fasting, particularly intermittent fasting. There's enough documented research that shows that fasting will, one, help us metabolize fat. It will slow the aging process and it will put our body into ketosis which is a state in which we could burn fat, we could regenerate cells and actually get healthier. 
And just like uh, with detoxing, you just can't, uh, it's about how you fast. So there's many different methods. You can fast two days a week and then eat normally five days. You can fast the 16-8 method where you eat during eight hours and then you fast 16 hours. There's so many different types of fasting, but the documented results on how great it is for weight loss and health make it a great choice for anybody who pursues it. Well, and I'm, I want to touch on one thing that you said in there because it went by so quickly that some <laughs> people may not have grasped it. Slowing down the aging process. Okay, so for those yes. of you that didn't catch that, okay, so all of the other reasons and everything, but think about that one particular one. Slowing down the aging process, uh, you know, that's huge. So, um, you know, and again, and these are things that are in the book. Oh, yeah, it's, it's huge. I think, um, you know, if we think about I'm going to be 50, my next birthday is 50, which is a, a big milestone. Um, and so slowing the aging process is something I'm always interested in because it's not even about vanity. It's about how I physically feel when I wake up. I don't like the feeling of being sluggish, tired, achy, joint. And so I want, I don't mind aging as long as I look and feel good. And so for me, I'm very much interested in any uh, type of program, even product, product supplements that really slow down the aging process. And I think anti-aging and weight loss go so hand in hand. One will impact the other so dramatically. I mean, the body, the skin, what we look like on the outside is just a reflection of what's going on on the inside. And so, so many of these eating plans really will determine also how you look and feel as you age. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think that's a great point. And I know that, um, you know, that those around us, we, we want them to be healthy. But I think sometimes we don't share some of the knowledge that we have because we think that they're going to be offended. Because if you start talking to somebody about eating healthier and they're overweight, sometimes they jump to, what, what are you saying, I'm fat? You know, and it's, no, mm -hmm. I just, you know, I'm doing the keto diet and you said that I seem like I have a lot of energy, so I'm suggesting that maybe it's something that you try. You know, so, you know, to to bring something <laughs> like that in, you know, which, which kind of takes me to the question of, you know, how important is, you know, the environment on our, on our progress, you know, you know, as, as one goes through their own journey, um, you know, the environment, the people that are around us, the type of support that we get, you know, can you give us some examples of questions we should ask ourselves in order to achieve success and avoid setbacks and failures? Well, I mean, I think for everybody, it's about what is the quality of life you want to live? And so do you want it to deteriorate as you get older or do you want to you know, gracefully uh, grow older and still feel mentally strong and physically strong and emotionally strong. We have to do the hard work in life. And whether we're struggling uh, professionally, financially, physically, we have to take the time to gain knowledge and understand. See, for me, I am an, I'm a writer, so I'm an avid reader. And so if I wake up and I don't, if I feel tired, I'm going to read and study about why I feel tired. If I've gained 30 pounds or 40 pounds, which I've had before, I'm going to learn everything I can about how to help my body release that. And so for me, it's for every problem, there's a solution. So it's about, you have to say, what do I want my life to look like? What is the quality of life? How do I want to feel? How do I want to grow old? How do I want to live? And then you have to be so deliberate about getting knowledge in that area. In this age, with so many I mean, forget books. I mean, just with the Internet, we uh -huh. can learn. We can learn whatever we want to learn. And so, you know, I think a lot of times we don't we move so fast. Everything's at a fast pace. We don't stop to reflect, to gain knowledge and to learn and really say, am I living the life that I want for myself? And then putting together a game plan to create the, the life that we have. I once um, read a book. I can't even remember the book. I just remember this being in the book. This was like 25 years ago. And it said, what the worst thing that you can do is let your life pass you by. And you, for 40 years, you wake up in a house you don't love, in a neighborhood that you don't like. You go to a job where you're not fond of your coworkers or boss. 
You don't like what you do for a living. You do that for eight hours, get in your car, drive home, only to wake up and do it again the next day. And if you repeat that over and over, 30, 40 years, your life would have passed you by and you spent the majority of your time doing something that you did not enjoy or lived in a place that you did not like. And you have the power to change it today so that you can reflect back and be pleased at the decisions you made or the changes you made. And I think everybody should really do that soul searching before it's too late. And it's like every day we get a brand new chance to get a fresh start, brand new mercies every day. And so I think um, it's really about self-reflection, but we move so fast. We never really stop to think about how we want to live. Hey, and you know what? And food is part of that. It, it is the medicine. It is, you know, it is such a huge part of everybody's life and has such a huge impact in the way in which we live. Now, our guest today is J.J. Smith, and her latest book is called Think Yourself Thin. We're going to take a break. If you want to follow along with us, you can go to her website, which is jjsmithonline.com. You can follow along with us. Uh, and you know we're going to take a break. We'll only be about a minute. You don't have to run out and get a snack. We'll be right back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Our topic today is Think Yourself Thin, and we have some listener questions and comments. And again, I want to thank everybody that takes the time to do this. I know that we get comments that come in and people say, you know, your show's in the middle of the day. We're going to send this in ahead of time. And we'd love to have your guest answer it. And we will listen later on once we get off work, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, so this first one reads, losing weight has been a roller coaster in my life. And now that I'm in my 40s, although I look thin, the area around my middle is almost impossible to get rid of. And then in quotes, it says that tummy roll it says I exercise three days a week, do sit ups. But there it is. It always stays right there. I feel like it is an emotional block uh, more so than a physical one. What are your thoughts on this, and would your book help me? And this is from Joyce in Washington. Sure. I, um, it's, um, uh, let me say this. Losing belly fat, it, you don't really do a lot to do abs and crunches if you have a lot of belly fat. Let me explain what I mean. If you burn away the belly fat, everybody has a six-pack under there, right? Everyone's abs core is flat. What the focus has to be on burning belly fat, and that's getting rid of the fat. And so it's not an emotional block. If you are a woman or a man over 35, then you are going to struggle to lose belly fat because what happens as we age is our hormones decline, and it causes us to have, and weight loss experts know this, there's fat and then there's stubborn body fat. And so fat generally responds to working out and ex eating clean, working out, exercise, the stuff we know. But stubborn body fat doesn't respond to it as well. And for women, as our hormones decline, we particularly store fat on our belly, our upper arms, our hips and thighs. And so that stubborn body fat, it's not going to respond to a bunch of sit-ups and crunches. You're going to have to look into optimizing your hormones for weight loss. Um, I talk about it in one of my I actually have a book called Six Ways to Lose Belly Fat Without Exercise, and it talks about balancing your hormones and why 
belly fat is a stubborn body fat, and the traditional things that most people do are not the most effective for getting results. And so I, I will say that I um, used to struggle with belly fat because I didn't understand how to get rid of it. Everything else would respond to eating clean and working out except for belly fat. Um, but after my long journey to understand, I, I did write a book about it. Okay. Well, again, Joyce, thank you for that question. Um, we have another one here that says, my granddaughter, who is 14, is starting to put on weight, and I'm trying to help my son and granddaughter figure out what they can do about this. <clears throat> Just getting her to eat vegetables, as she did when she was young, is almost impossible unless they're on a pizza in a frozen dinner or in a can of soup. She is beginning to feel self-conscious about the weight. Before I buy the book, can you tell me, is she too young for what you are presenting? And this is from Patsy in Vermont. No, I don't think anybody, anybody dealing with uh, being overweight, um, there's never, it's never too early to establish good eating habits that help our body, help our body stay slim and healthy. So I think the way to look at it is uh, my books teach people how to be slim. And the thing about it is, is at any age, if you, I wish someone taught me about good eating habits and self-love when I was 14 because I wouldn't have struggled with weight in my 30s. But I wasn't, not, I wasn't, um, I hadn't learned a lot about how to eat to help my body stay slim or self-love or just loving my own body, loving the skin I was in. But the time to learn it is when you're really young so you can take those habits into your adulthood. And so it's definitely for anybody who's struggling with being overweight because at the end of the day, being overweight, there's so many emotional and spiritual issues that go on in a person's life that impacts their weight, the earlier you, you address them, the earlier you set yourself up for long-term success with weight. Or weight will be a roller coaster, a struggle forever. And nobody wants that. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. And again, I'm glad that they asked this question because I really want to touch on sort of the, the crisis that we have now with our children. I mean, from my standpoint, I mean, your books should be in every classroom. You know, that when oh, thanks for saying that. I mean, children at a younger age should be getting educated to this, you know, this idea of taking care of their body and doing it and starting young. You know, I think that there's so much influence of the junk food, the junk food industry, you know, of of putting so much pressure on. Look, you know, this is, you know, you know, this is what you want, you know, because of commercialism and stuff that, you know, you have this whole generation now of, of children that have been raised on, you know, on junk food. And we're seeing the increases in so many diseases that are affecting them early. So yeah, to me, you know, I, I love the fact that, that Patsy asked this and the fact that she is wanting to help, you know, her granddaughter now. And as you said, not, not have her wait until she's in her thirties to figure out how to do this on her own. Right. So, now, let me ask this. Is is there a wrong time to try to take control of your weight? Um, you know, I, you know, there's it seems like there's, you know, whatever, you know, I don't know, 100 excuses. You know, you, you'll have yeah. somebody talk about, you know, they'll go, you know, yeah, I was thinking about that, but it's not the right time because of pick one. You know, uh -huh. is, is there really a wrong time? There is no wrong time. There's no magic about January 1. There's no magic about Monday. The right time is today because there will be <laughs> literally the right time is today. There's nothing unique about having to start on a Sunday or Monday. It could be a Wednesday and it's the right time because the same excuses, the same challenges, the same things that may cause us not to be ready will happen every single day. I mean, people have, pro it's called procrastination. In the Thank Yourself Thin book, I start a chapter, it's called Slay Resistance. And the chapter says this, and people can relate to this. We sit there, it's evening, we decide, I'm going to go to the gym in the morning. So they set their alarm for 5 a.m. so they can get up, go to the gym, and start their day off strong. So they go to bed, set the alarm, and then beep, 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 the alarm goes off at 5 a.m. They hit the snooze button, turn it off, and go back yeah. to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I say, is this a big deal? And, you, and I say, you absolutely believe it is because you just lost the first battle of the day. 
and everything else you do is going to, you're going to have an uphill battle because that apathetic feeling of not doing what we know we should, that procrastination, doubt, fear, it's, it's resistance. And if we don't learn to slay resistance, fight through it, we're going to struggle in every area of our life. I mean, I've written six books and every time I sit down to write, I'll check email or I'll see what's going on Facebook or I'll check the news, anything to avoid doing the hard work, the stuff that's really challenging. But people have to understand that feeling of not wanting to do what we know we should. It's, it's our responsibility to fight through it because the more we do it, the less it becomes difficult to do the hard work in life. And uh, a lot of people just give in every day. They give in every day. Oh, I'm going to eat healthy today. They give in. Oh, I'm going to eat healthy. The more you give in, the, the harder you're making it. And on the other side of resistance is the life we want. It's the body we want. It's the job and career we want for ourselves. But you've got to slay resistance. You've got to fight through it if you want those things. And that's our responsibility to get it. You've got to go for it. And I'm just so aware that I catch myself even, you know, Knowing that, oh, this feeling, ah, yeah, okay, that's right. This is that feeling that always comes whenever I got to do something I don't want to do or that's a little bit challenging. But you have to be able to slay resistance and fight through. Well, I, again, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, but it's still, it still is something that I think that many of us have to, you know, not only have to fight through, but lose that battle. So, Let's talk a little bit about creating a support system that can maybe help us fight through that. So, you know, why is a support system, you know, important in these situations and what's the best way that we can set it up? Well, it's interesting because a lot of people have close family and friends that literally they need to detox family and friends. And even if someone is a close relative, we should try to spend as little time with them as possible if they are not encouraging and supporting us. You have to put yourself in an environment where you are celebrated, appreciated, and loved and put yourself in that environment. For a lot of people, we have a lot of online support groups for weight loss. For a lot of people, they may be the only one in their household trying to lose weight. And so you have family members bringing in all this unhealthy junk food, and they're not deliberately trying to hurt us. They love us. But the habits and the way they live may be totally inconsistent with what we want for ourselves. So you have to seek out a support system, whether it's online or it's an in-person support group, because you need like-minded people who are on the same journey with you, who understand what you're going through, and who are going to encourage you through the tough times. And a lot of times in our circle, or like, let's think about it, adults deal with peer pressure as well. So we may work take our lunch to work, we know what we're going to eat, we fix our healthy meal, and our coworkers say, oh, well, let's go get a burger and fries. Well, you know you brought your lunch, but you think you might miss something. You know, it's about being committed. When you make a commitment to lose weight, there are some sacrifices that have to be made. You may miss out on going to lunch with your friends or coworkers, and that's okay because if there is something that you want for yourself, sacrifices come with it because you're aiming for a higher goal of, a better quality of life. So you just may not be able to go to work with some of your friends. But seek out support systems. I mean, we have uh, one of our green smoothie groups has 700,000 people in it, of uh, people actively trying to lose weight. And the encouragement, I mean, I use it for encouragement. I don't want to eat it. I never, look, I never wake up and say, wow, I can't wait to eat a salad today. I wake up, I want a pizza and every single day. It never, I mean, I, I'd rather eat pizza and lasagna every day. So people think, whoa, she writes books about eat nutrition. And no, I want to eat unhealthy. But for me, it will not allow me to live, look, and feel the way I want to. So the sacrifice is I just can't have it every day. A cheat meal here and there is fine, but every day is going to work against my goals. And so for me, I use our, uh, an online support group, one that um, I set up four years ago, and um you just have to be on with like-minded people who can understand what you're going through, particularly when you're struggling. Now, how can listeners um, reach that online group? Is that through your website or is there another way? For yeah. Um, if they, this particular group is on Facebook, it's uh, about 700,000 people. It's free, no cost. I have four uh, moderators that literally run the group 24 hours a day. 
So anytime you have a question or you need support or encouragement, someone's there for you. And it's um, called the 10-Day Green Smoothie Cleanse Group because it started out as a group of 100 people doing the 10-Day Green Smoothie Cleanse together. And we were supporting each other for the 10 days, and it's just evolved into a, a free online weight loss support group for anybody who's interested or committed, you know, because there's a difference between everybody's interested in, in losing weight. Like every overweight person is interested in losing weight. But the question is, are you committed? Are you willing to put in the work and make some sacrifices? And so when you join an online support group like that, you hear people's stories and you realize, ah, oh, I did the same thing or I can relate to that or she's just like me or she knows what it's like to have kids want to eat unhealthy while you eat healthy. I mean, it's just being able to relate to people makes the journey easier. And that's what those groups do. Well, and uh, again, for those that you're out there driving and you can't write that down, um, you can go to JJ's website and either connect that way, uh, which is jjsmithonline.com, or you can go to our Answers for the Family website, answersforthefamily.com, and we will be able to connect you to that. But that's that's the Facebook um it's Facebook, and it is the uh, 10-Day Green Smoothie Cleanse Facebook. Is that yep. correct? Okay. That's correct. Got it. You know, when you were talking about the the friends at work and the things like that, you know, I think another thing that we might want to add to that is, is that, you know, be a leader. You know, so, uh, you know, w- when everybody keeps saying, let's go to fill in the blank of fast food place so that I'm not just ripping on one in particular. Um, right. You know, that, that maybe it's like, you know what, I found this great vegan place down the street that just does this incredible stuff. Let's try that, you know. And so you can yeah, still you can, have, you can have the social part, but be the leader, be the one that says, you know what, this is good for all of us. So don't think of it as a selfish thing like, oh, yeah, they just want to go to there for themselves. No, I want to share it with you, too. That's right. That's yeah. right. You can be a leader and actually get other people to join you on the healthy journey opposed to the other way around. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, also, now I, I know in, in the new book, uh, y- you talk about the five psychological stages required to lose weight, and the key is, and keep it off. So, Oh, my goodness. That's the main thing. Yeah. Can you, can you walk us through some of those? The five stages? Yes. Sure. Sure. The... Interesting thing about the five stages is um, I wanted people to understand that when you're on the journey from I want to lose weight to getting to your goal weight is that there are a lot of things that happen and if you can, re- if, and people can literally find themselves in one of the five stages, but it was super important because if we don't understand the stages, it, it will cause us to quit and we're not prepared because we don't know what to expect. And so in the book, the first stage we talk about, I call the first stage set up. This is the trigger. This is the thing that makes us decide, I got to lose some weight. It could be the doctor says you have to lose weight. It could be, you know, maybe someone said something about your weight. It made you uncomfortable. Whatever the trigger is, is deeply personal. You could see, uh, there was one lady who said she saw someone posted a picture on Facebook when they went out and she saw herself in the picture and couldn't realize, didn't realize how much weight she's gained. But the first step is there is always a triggering event that makes someone decide, Hey, I need to lose some weight. And then once you get started, everybody goes through stage two. It's the honeymoon. It's the starting strong. Any new weight loss or diet plan that you start and you follow, you're going to lose weight right away. That is normal and expected. And most people are feeling pretty good now because the weight's starting to come off pretty consistently every day. Then in stage three, we call it the stall. This is the dreaded weight loss plateau. This is when, and this happens to everybody, the things you were doing, the diet you were following, the workout regimen that you were doing, it's not getting you the same results. Maybe weeks have gone by and you haven't lost any weight. This is the stage that most people quit. Oh, weight loss isn't for me, or maybe I'm just not meant to be slim because they don't understand what is happening to cause the plateau. So we explain why everybody will, most people will plateau here, and we give you some tips to kind of work yourself through the plateau so you don't quit and you understand that that is normal. That is a normal stage. 
And then stage four is reaching your ideal weight. And this is when you get all the compliments and people are noticing and you've broken through that weight loss plateau and you've finally gotten to your ideal goal. And this is really particularly important is because getting to your goal is one thing, but in stage five, maintaining it is another. It, there is a national registry of what's called weight loss masters. And these are the people who've lost over 30 pounds and kept it off for more than a year. And they were trying to understand what are the common behaviors of people who can keep weight off. So in this chapter, we talk about, we, we talk about the weight loss masters, but more importantly, we talk about how to keep the weight off. What is a reasonable weight, 5 to 10 pounds, where you're not overly concerned if you gain a few pounds, but what is that weight that you say, oh, man, i got to get back on track? Because there's nothing more devastating than getting to your goal weight and then gaining the weight back. And that is stage five about how to maintain and keep the weight off. Now, I'm, uh, I'm getting an, an email uh, question that's coming over uh, right now as we speak. And this one says, what's your thoughts on freezing the fat? Freezing the fat? Um, yeah. Here's the thing. There, there's all these little, um, I'm not going to name, the, there's a couple of brands that actually do it. I know some people that have. That it will work, but not if you have bad eating habits because you'll gain it all back. So, so many people would rather waste money doing surgery to get rid of fat, but those thir- in 90% of the cases, whether you freeze it or do lipo, if you don't know how to get rid of fat, you're going to gain it all back. None of them are permanent, and bad eating habits always lead to gaining weight, which is what will happen, even if you, do, uh, you freeze the fat or if you do lipo or any of those methods. It's all about your eating habits at the end of the day. Well, JJ, I got to tell you, this this has been great, and the time has just flown by. One of the things, that, one of the things that we do on this show, and and we get so many people that call or write in and tell us how much they like it, is the success stories. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Can you share, and especially if you're on this group with 700 people and stuff, uh, can you share one of your favorite success stories? Oh my goodness, we've had thousands of success stories over the years. But I think for me, one would be Deborah. She's 65. Um, oh, sorry. She's in her 60s. She's lost over 65 pounds and has become a Zumba instructor at, at 60 some. I don't know whether she's at 68, but at 60 some years old. What she does is break the myth of, the, you know, when you get older, it's difficult to lose weight. It may be more challenging than when you're 20, but it's not impossible. And Deborah being in her 60s, losing that much weight, becoming, a, you understand, like being 65 pounds overweight to becoming a fitness instructor mm-hmm. at 68 years old is pretty, pretty, um, you know, just amazing. And um, to listen to her and have talk about all her relatives and grandkids and people that have been positively influenced by her weight loss journey has been so encouraging. She had tons of health issues and was on all these meds and the doctors said she would never get off of them. And she has, she's gotten off the meds and just really turned her body into a healthy place for her to pursue all of her other life dreams, even at 60 some. You know, and I'm, I'm glad that you added the part about um, the other aspect of health. So more than just the fact that she lost the weight, more than just the fact that she became a health instructor, but she's not on the meds that the doctors were giving her that told her that she would never be able to get get yeah. off. of. I think that is huge. And so many people out there now, we've become such a over medicated society. So think about it. You know, for those people that say, you know what, I don't want to spend the whatever 50 bucks a month or something like that to, uh, you know, to join a gym. Think about right. how much you're spending on your meds every month, you know, right. <laughs> you know, and so, all the side effects that come with the meds. Yeah, exactly. So, so yes, yeah, definitely worth it in the long run. Living healthy is going to be a lot easier and less expensive in the long run. Amen to that. And so, so JJ, I just wanted to thank you and really acknowledge, you know, what you've done and everything uh, in helping so many people. And also, and even for me personally, uh, I'm trying to think of how many years ago it was. But anyway, about the time that your first book came out. So 
again some years ago, uh, you know, I, I got your first book and I started making green smoothies and mm. and um, and even, you know, my kids were still in school and stuff. And some of their friends would, you know, some of the friends said, wow, he looks like he drinks pond scum. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I my making, gosh. Yeah, they were nasty looking things. Um, but, you know, they obviously they tasted better than that. But, you know, but anyway, mm -hmm. it's just it's something that I added in. And for somebody with a busy life and, you know, and, and two boys in school, you know, it, it just fit perfectly. And it really helped me get through that time. And now I've passed it on to them. And now both of them, they do the same thing. They've got their own bullets and, you know, they're now young men. Uh, wow, but, that's awesome. You know, they're living healthier, too. So, you know, that that is awesome. But again, I mean, you know, your book was the one that I read and went, OK, this is the way I'm going to start making these to get the optimum um, benefit from it. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear. Wonderful. That is awesome. All right. Well, again, thank you. And for everybody out there, please be sure to put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we're joined by Diane L. Redleaf to discuss her new book, They Took the Kids Last Night. It's how child protective systems sometimes put families at risk. And please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com or you can subscribe to our show through iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if, if you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people and we greatly appreciate it. Next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page as well as JJ's page and check out some of our latest posts. If you like them, please like us, spread the word, be good human beings, and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza. Right here on L.A. Talk Radio.